week six. We will finish it loss analysis and hopefully by this week we'll get the calculation done. And now we'll move into trying to fit components for the heating system. So this would be to do selecting the heating unit for each room, which means you get the heat calculation. You want to choose what heat distribution you're going to have for each room. You can have a basement radiator, you can have boards, you can have a convector, whatever you can have ready for heating. So this is how we select a heating unit for each room. So we'll learn how to do the math for this. How is it calculated? Again, it's not just mix and match. You cannot just eyeball it. You need to have, can you have a phone up? Phone with me. So you need to know how these things are sized. You can't just eyeball it. Some people just eyeball it by the window size. They put the same window size underneath and it's going to be frustrating because you're not going to get the same amount of heat. Uh, decide on the location of the boiler. Where would you put the boiler? Sometimes it's convenient to have the boiler in the center of the house. Why is that? Or what would you think? So you get, when you put the boiler, you gotta think about the foundation. We talked about the boiler last time. For the other class, that has to be on solid foundation in the basement, in the bottom floor. You gotta think about the foundation. You gotta think about the oil tank, distance from other appliances. And also, you want to be convenient. So you want to be in the central location so you can have the least amount of piping. It doesn't make sense to put it really in the corner. Meanwhile, you have one loop going around the house. So we'll, when we look at the piping scheme, we want to know where we put the boiler. Sometimes there is only one location. Sometimes the people who did the, the, the house floor plan did not consider that location. So you have to work on it. But if you were to design a system, you want to design it for the proper place for the boiler. Design the number of roofs, zones. So how do we plan for that? How many zones do we want? You can't have the entire house as one zone. But what, what will be the drawback for that? It'll be running all the time. All, right. all the time. The whole house will be the same temperature. I Meanwhile, you don't need it. It will waste money. You have less, yeah, less <coughs> control over the, over the temperature. I mean, even in the cars now, they have zoning, which is really interesting. New cars now, you have left driver's side and passenger side. And in the back, you yeah, have the same thing. thing. Well, it's for comfort. Some one person wants 80 degrees, the other person wants 55, so comfort. And also now the back seats have their own zoning. So the more zones, the more comfort you'll have for the resident. And also, it will save you money, because at least in the front, the heat is free. But in, in the house, you're paying for it. So if you are going to be in bedrooms and upstairs, you don't want to keep the basement. Makes sense? So the more zones you have, the better. Ideally, you want a zone for each room, but that will be a lot of zones. So we zone at least with two, one for the living space, and the other one for the sleeping area. And the bigger the house, the more zones you want. And now zoning, how do we do zoning usually? If we, if we, now we're talking about hot water. If we're doing hot water, how do we do zoning? Two things. So you're gonna have top zone out, which is this thing here, which we're learning to install in the other class. So you're gonna have a zone valve. So this control, two things. It can either control small little pumps or you can have one major pump and small little zone valve. So this will control the flow of hot water in each room or either by a pump or by a zone valve. So you're gonna have a taco. Taco or Teku, zone valve, and they have a lot of selections there for these uh, zone valves. Uh, and again, the more zones you want, uh, you have, the better, because again, now we'll have the less heat in the house. So we'll talk about how do we size the pump for each one of those zones, and what is the heating requirement. Picking the right tubing for the entire house size. So you want the pipe to be consistent. You want to reduce the amount of changing from large to small, small to large. Why? More <coughs> resistance. But for what? Washer. Pressure. The pressure will be very consistent. The flow will be very consistent. And I don't want to go too much into the physics of fluid dynamics, but we want to you have continuous flow of pressure. The same pipe will be great. If you reduce the pipe, you will increase the pressure, and that could 
in terms of flow, and also it has something to do with the velocity of the water. If the water is too fast, it's not going to release heat. And if it's too fast, it will be noisy. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But we want, uh, usually for, for housing, what is the most common size? Three quarters. Three quarters is more, the most common one. And it's, uh, it is uh, consistent with the moving in more radius. So this is the most common one. It does the job for most houses. But in some cases, you might need something bigger or something smaller. So this is the most common one. We will determine the pump requirement. Again, pump sizing is very, very essential. A lot of uh, people, sorry. A lot of people will just eyeball the pump and they just tell you this pump will do. Uh, and you will see now why it would not be the case all the time. So you cannot just like uh, pick any pump from the shop and put it in. If you go to the Taco website, they have a, a calculator that will ask you what is the GPM that you required and what is the head and we will understand what it does mean. And these are very essential information for you to have to pick the proper size pump. What is, what is when we talk about pump head, head is obviously high, so how much the pump have power to pump water at what height? Because water is head. Basically, if you're pumping for water up to 12 feet, you need, you're going to carry water as heavy as 12 feet high in three quarter size pipe. So that's something we have to think about and uh, we'll, I'll give you the proper calculation. Not the proper, there's so many ways to calculate this. I'll at least uh, try to find the most uh, convenient and the least complicated way to size the pump. And uh, we'll do a few practices on those to see how we, how we size the pump. Size the thermal expansion tank. The thermal expansion tank is very important to maintain pressure in the system. Uh, this is what it looks like. So probably you've seen those in many, many systems. Usually it comes in the uh, output of the tank. Usually they're hanging upside down. And uh, if you look here, there's a valve, Schrader valve, so you can pressurize the system, so you can keep the system under pressure. And what it does, it allows for expansion of the water so the water, as it, as the water gets hot, it expands, and we calculate the amount of expansion. So this membrane here will take the expansion, because if you don't have a, any kind of flexibility in the system, what will happen to the water as it expands? It will, it will start to leak. So if you have a leak, you know you have undersized expansion tank. And this expansion tank is relevant to the amount of water that you have in the system. What is the amount of water you have in the system? About it. Imagine we have a hydraulic system. What is the water inside? It's a closed system, right? So you know the water should have a certain amount of gallons. So you have the water inside the boiler, correct? The water inside the pipes. The water inside the radiators. So what else? That's the entire water in the system. So you're going to calculate the entire amount and see what is the amount of expansion will happen when we heat the water from 65 to 180. Again, to make things simpler, because you always interact with cars, does your car have an expansion tank? They all do. Yeah, that's the expansion tank. As the water expands, it will overflow to the tank and comes back again, right? So when the, when the car is warm, I, I need to tell you, the max are minimum based on hot and cold. So, as, the, as the, the car heats up, the water will expand and flow into the little tank, and as it cools off, it will suck more water from the tank. So that's your expansion tank. And the amount of uh, water in your car is calculated based on the engine size, the tubing, and the radiator size. And usually, you're not supposed to lose any water. Maybe you lose it in a few months, but it's not really small. Whenever you go to the oil change, they pass it off a little bit. That's the, that, that's to account for the evaporation. And usually during the summertime when we have a lot of evaporation. Maybe a little bit in the winter because it is drier. But it should always maintain its size. And that's why we always have a filling, filling uh, valve. System does lose some water from the vent. But uh, in our system, you should not be losing a lot of water. Especially if it's hot water tank. If you have steam, you're not supposed to lose 
any water uh, unless the, your, your air vents are kind of clogged or uh, they are leaking some steam. Uh, if you see, do you think steam system require scratching that? The steam system? I wouldn't think so because no. we would have a uh, purge. Steam system does not have an expansion tank, but it's really hot and it has a relief valve and has also vents. So if you are going to to steam, you're not going to need expansion tank. So I will see how to size expansion tank again. I bought the expansion tank is an issue. If you have an undersized tank, it will leak. If you have an oversized tank, it will not have that pressure for the system. So we will have to tie that correctly. Uh, take the system controls. What do we have for control? Running well. We have, uh, you can need some thermostats. That's your input. You're gonna need some aqua stats. You're gonna need some zoning valves or pumps or zone control. And by now, if you've taken an existing lab, you did the wiring for all these components. We feel comfortable with that. So and so, we'll do some wine and live boilers and see how it goes. Okay, so water temperature. So we are going to design a proper, proper heating system. You want to maintain the water at certain temperature to know what are we dealing with. For example, your car temperature is designed to run at what? 220, 210? No, 220, 220, 220, 220, 220. Okay. And that's without boiling the water. Without boiling the water. <coughs> you can put, uh, what is it, 110? Uh, 210? Temperature? Boiling. No, no, for the car temperature. <laughs> Depends on that car. Yeah, like it, it, it could be like one. Yeah, I've seen all cars that has to go, I was boiling, but uh, the new one has to go 210. Cars don't yeah. So the point being is, you need to maintain the car temperature. So whenever you turn on your car, it will heat up, then it will stop the heating and maintain that temperature within that range. Even if you if you if you go on a highway, it will still maintain the temperature. How does it do that? There's a thermistor, a thermostat on the on the incoming water to choke the flow, get too much flow, and also there is a sensor to monitor the water temperature. It's called. Uh, probably if you turn on your car in the morning, you'll see the RPM is a little bit high because it's really cold and try to achieve the right temperature quickly. Uh, older cars, like if you go for uh, if you drive a car from the 60s or the 70s, the car will not run properly until it heats up. Because again, we have carburetors and it's quite high temperature. So when they plan it, I'm scared. I am scared too. <laughs> this is intense. This is intense. Your fear is valid. The amount of heat coming out of the radiator, this is the amount of heat. So we gotta know what is the amount of heat coming from the radiator. If you can look at this and see this is uh, 590 BTU at water temperature of 180 per foot. So that's another factor. So what other three factors we have to look at when we size radiators? So, temperature drop. So, do you expect the water coming in to have the same temperature coming out? 
No, otherwise, what's the point? I'm supposed to lose some water temperature. So we always assume 20 degrees temperature drop. I want to drop by 20 degrees. So the water coming in at 180, and it wants to come out at 160, 150 double degrees. We can do that. So we want to lose 20 degrees of uh, water temperature inside the tube. Like the radiator, and we have options. So the option we can control the size and the amount of heat comes out uh, that's coming out. And some of them they have fans to allow more convection. So <clears throat> this table probably you will find in a lot of designing pamphlet if you want to buy some radiators. Let's look at this table very carefully because I'm going to ask a few questions in the homework. I need the quiz pertaining this day. So let's stay out of work. And you'll, it's very common, you'll see it a lot. So first thing we see here is the tube size inside the radiator. Type A, three quarters of an inch. Type B, half an inch. I've seen both. Which one is more common? Type A. It's more common. Because the more tube size you have, the more surface area you have to displace the heat. Yeah, yeah. And second thing is the water flow in GPM inside the, the tube. So we have, bless you, we have from one gallon per minute to four gallons per minute. So you have a range. That's, that's the upper limit, and that's the lower limit. Can we go faster? Yes, we can, but you're not supposed to. If you go faster, what will happen? You will disrupt the flow of heat from the tube to the room. What was that? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. <laughs> so what do final four? Funny. Okay, so you wish to go to Google. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the pressure drop. Why is the pressure drop important? Excellent, and that will affect your pump size. If you don't have the proper pump size, it's not going to push through the entire, all the radiators. At some point, it will crap out, other, okay, there's no water flow, no water flow, no heat, system is ill designed, and somebody's gotta go over there and do a quick fix, and probably it's not going to be done nicely, because you're gonna have to add a pump, the pump's gonna be oversized, so it's better to get things done quickly the first time. Uh, so this is the pressure drop, Milli inch per foot, and I will explain a lot why does that mean. <coughs> why are we using foot and inches for pressure? I'll explain that in very <coughs> boring detail. Because we need to know that. Again, sizing the pump is very, very important. And people actually pay people, pay others to size the pump because they don't know what's going on. And you can have a system that's running, but you're not getting the right pressure. And if you ask Bill, it will tell you a lot of people who install kickboards, they do not get any heat out of it because they did not size the pressure correctly. The pressure drop in that pipe. So this is the pressure drop that happens in the pipe. Why do we have pressure drop? Let's look at the tube. So what happens to water when it goes through a tube? It will have resistance because of what? So if you look at the water tube, everybody's done with this? Can I read this? Yes? No? This is a water tube. So do you agree that water is sticky? That water is sticky. Yeah, sticky. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which is more sticky, oil or more water? Oil. Yeah. Oil. So the stickiness, I'm trying to use a simple term, it's called viscosity, but there's also capillary effect for water. So let's say it is, water does stick. If you get wet, water is sticking to your, to your body. Does air sticks? No. Every fluid sticks. If water does not stick, 
probably you would have low air resistance when you drive your car. That's why when you wax your car, they say it will take you pure mind because there's less thickness of the air to your body. It's smoother. So every fluid has some thickness factor. Viscosity. We all of viscosity, which is the fluid of the air, and it's ability to stick so to the air. Makes it sticky. Yeah. The air of sticks to the your car and pulls it back. That's why you have drag. Otherwise, it's like it's like swimming. Like like yeah, right. Just, just from if you run, if you run really fast. No, I'm not getting yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to explain. So, uh, uh, if you if you if you hit a ball, if you run very fast, the faster you go, the more drag you have. Drag is the is a function of the fluid sticking to your body and slowing you down. Of course, air is less than water. If you swim, there's really a lot of resistance. But if air is less than water, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. So even if you run on a treadmill, but you, if you want to mimic real life running, you're gonna to have to put one at least one incline so you can account for the air resistance because air does push against your body, and it's not even about it's not pushing against it; it just the the drag. So what happens to the water as it goes through the pipe? It will stick to the the tool, the pipe. So the velocity here. What is the last year? Is it's zero. It's not moving. In a microscopic level, it's not moving. It drags very slow. And here, you will have the mass. So, at the wall. You have zero velocity because again the wall is sticking to the water. Uh, so you think the material will matter? Yes, it will matter. Yes. Copper is softer than steel. If you have a smooth pipe, you will have faster flow. The more the, the smoother the material, the less the effect of the water to stick to it. If you have rough surface, that problem will make the water move slower. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this is the function of the pressure drop. Let's think about let's think about the water temperature. So we have between 140 all the way to 220. We don't want to exceed 220 because that's the that is the boiling temperature, and you don't want to have boiling water and steam inside the tools because they are not designed to handle a lot of water pressure and probably if you have a lot of steam and steam pressure you will have a lot of leaks in those tools. So this is the water range and why do we have to know the water range? Because we have to design where is the water in terms of water temperature and we can assume a drop of 20 degrees per foot. And if we assume that the room is at 65 degrees Fahrenheit and this is my water temperature. This is how much BTU I will drop per foot. So let's look at this one over here. So the water temperature, it's a three quarter tool type A. The temperature is 180. And this one is giving us 590, so probably the flow is 4 GPM. This is 580 and 590 is close enough. So this is how we pick how much BTU is per foot. So if I want to size radiator, type A at water temperature 180, 550, and I need, the, for example, 5,500 BTUs per hour. How many foot do I need? We'll do it exact. So whatever your room BTU, we divide the BTUs per the number you get from the table, and that'll be how long, uh, Radiator you need. Let's look at this example. So you will need these calculations for your project, and they will come in your quiz, and they will be on the final because again, it's very important on what is the relationship between the radiator and the water temperature. A room that requires 5,000 BTU feet. If we were to install a type A radiator at one GPM and water temperature at 180, how many feet of radiator 
will be needed to be installed. So my BPU here is what 5,000. And I have uh, water temperature. Flow rate is 1 GPM. I need to know how many times X. So let me go back. So I have times X, 1 GPM, 180. This is the BTU per hour per foot. From the table, Going to divide uh, total BTUs. <laughs> Should be around nine feet. Pretty simple. What do you think? Very straightforward. What do you need to know? You just find the BTU. I usually. It's provided with, with whatever radiator you need. And it's good before before you go to double check the dimensions of your floor plan. And make sure you don't put a nine feet radiator in a small room. Question. Why they put GPM in there? Good question. Gallons. You need to know the type and the gallons and how much you're gonna get from the radiator. So if you if you look here, this is the one, this is the flow between one between one and four. So if you flow the lowest limit is one GPM. That will give you 550. You can pump it faster, and you'll get 580. So this is the lower limit and the upper limit. GPM is the amount of water going through the guys. So is the 550 then the amount of BTUs you're losing? Yeah. Per it's giving off. Or, oh, yeah. it's giving off. Right. Yeah. 550 at one GPM. 580 at uh, four <coughs> GPM. What if you get two? Yeah. Would, would you? It's gonna be in between. <coughs> If you have 30, so it's gonna be a bit, well, eyeball between those two. If you see the difference, not that big. But they don't want you to go lower or higher. Why? That will affect the efficiency. And uh, probably will, uh, lower will be really low heat loss, and higher will start having some noise. Start like getting the water flow, and you don't want that. The water starts to cavitate and make some bubbles. We'll do a few more examples, we'll have more. So type A, 1 GPM, 180 is 550 BTU per foot. Uh, any questions about that? Do you understand how, how we did that? Find the number, divide, and we're good. And in the quiz, I'll give you the tables. You don't have to memorize them. I don't want you to memorize any formulas or any numbers. Just know how to pick the number. Example two, a room that requires a heating load of 7,000 BTU is to be heated with type B radiator at water temperature of 200 degrees Fahrenheit, flow rate of 2 GPM, how many feet of radiator is needed and what is the pressure drop at that radiator? So the pressure drop is something else we need to account for because of what? Of course we need to know the pumping power required. At some point we might need to do that. So let's look at it. If I go back into the table, so let's, I'm going to write down the information so I don't forget. So what do I have? Uh, type B. And temperature. And 2 GPM. <coughs> What is my flow? BQ per hour. Mm -hmm. 
Time B. 2 GPM is going to be in between. Water temperature is 200. So. 700. Oh no, 700. Right? That's, our, that's a fair deal. <coughs> 700. I got 680. It's not going to make a big difference. So if you put the number between 680 and 720, it should be, should be good. I did the division. I got 10.29. Are you gonna go and hit 10.29? Like a drop. So it's gonna be 10 and a half. Always around to half a foot. We're not gonna like nitpick the, the numbers. Everybody feels comfortable doing this? Yeah. Okay. One more example. Can you write down the, that I'm all right down, I, I have to do it. So, I won't beat you. Go back to the table. Type B, 5 GPM is a little bit higher, which is going to make me lose more heat. So I'm going to go with 4. It's the closest thing I have, so I can increase it a little bit. Water temperature is 210, 780, so I can go with 790. And what else? So I've got to be 790. So from here, I'll get. And pressure drop is going to be 2000. divided by 1,000. Make sense? That's too precise. So, one milli inch equal one inch over 1,000. Then if I want to convert that to feet, how many inches in a foot? 12. So again, that will be over 12. So to convert one milli inch to a foot, one over 12,000 foot pressure drop. So in this case, what is my required length? I'll put it here in small, it will be 12,000 over 790. Pressure drop. It'll be 15 feet per foot. Is it 15 feet? Yeah. Okay. So 15 feet. Uh, what is the pressure drop? I can say it's 15 times whatever metal inch they gave me, which is 2,080. What is that? Is that a calculator? 43,200.
Everybody get this process? Yeah. Just pick the number, fill in the blanks, and you're all set. Why do we have to get millions again? Huh? Why do we have to get millions? Uh, that's for the pump cup, actually. We'll do it later. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.